Hello again, and welcome to the Chapter 15 online lecture. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 15 guided notes, which of course you should complete before you come to class. In this chapter, we're going to discuss what's known as the chromosomal theory of inheritance. This theory helps to explain how the specific chromosomes that carry certain genes, their specific locations on those chromosomes, which if you remember are referred to as a locus or loci, plural, and even the shape and size of the chromosomes themselves can affect how genes are inherited. Now remember that Mendel didn't know anything about DNA or chromosomes at all, but nonetheless he was able to determine the basic patterns of inheritance simply through observation and logic. That's pretty impressive. Now some of his ideas were pretty spot on, but others were a bit off. Our current knowledge about chromosomes actually helps us reinforce some of his ideas and expand on others. Mendel described two laws that he called the law of independent assortment and the law of segregation. These laws help describe how traits are passed from parent to offspring in random combinations. Today we know that this is mostly true because of how chromosomes behave during meiosis. Remember that during meiosis the maternal and paternal chromosomes get all mixed up together through crossing over, and then separate from one another through two separate divisions. Now because of this knowledge, you know that when your body makes egg cells or sperm cells, those cells are going to contain one copy of each chromosome, so 23 total, but there is no way of knowing which of your maternal or paternal genes each of those chromosomes carries. Now there are exceptions to Mendel's rules. It turns out that some genes tend to travel together on chromosomes from parent to offspring and are unlikely to become separated by crossing over. They tend to stick together. We refer to these types of genes as being linked. None of the traits that Mendel studied happened to be linked, so he didn't know anything about linkage. But linkage can affect genetic outcomes, so we need to discuss it. Linked genes tend to travel together from parent to offspring and are not likely to be separated by crossing over. For instance, consider a pea plant with the genotype big P, little p, big L, little l. In other words, it's heterozygous for two different traits. Now if we looked inside the pollen grains or the egg cells produced by this plant, we would expect to find one-fourth big P, big L, one-fourth big P little l, one-fourth little p big l, and one-fourth containing little p little l, according to Mendel's rules. However, in nature these types of plants mostly produce the gametes containing big P big L and little p little l. Why is that? Well this occurs because the genes for characteristics P and L are linked together. They're located on the same chromosome and they're located pretty close together. So genes that are located on the same chromosome are linked to one another. And the closer together the loci of the two genes, the more linkage exists. Genes that are located on different chromosomes, however, are not linked and they separate randomly from one another. So the only genes that behave by Mendel's rules are those that are located on separate chromosomes and are not linked. As an example, let's say that we take two pea plants, both of whom are heterozygous for the P and L traits, and we breed them together and we look at the F1 offspring. Now in this example, the peas represent flower color. So big P represents purple flowers, while little peas represent red flowers. 
The L's represent the shape of the pollen grain. So in pea plants, there are long pollen grains and there are short pollen grains. Big L represents long, little L represents the short pollen grain. Now according to Mendel's rules, this cross should produce a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio among the F1s. In other words, we would expect that 9 out of 16 of the offspring are going to be purple with long pollen grains, that 3 out of 16 will be purple with short pollen grains, that 3 out of every 16 are red with long pollen grains, and that only 1 out of 16 are red with short pollen grains. However, in nature, this cross mainly produces these two phenotypes purple with long pollen grains, and red with short pollen grains. So we get a lot more of the red with short pollen grains than expected. Why is this? Well, this occurs because the traits for flower color and for pollen shape are not dispersed randomly among the sex cells ex as expected. They don't follow Mendelian rules because these two traits are linked. They are located on the same chromosome, and are located close together on that chromosome. Here we have a homologous pair of chromosomes that carry the traits for flower color and for pollen shape. This chromosome carries the allele for purple flowers in combination with the allele for long pollen grains, while this other one carries the uh, allele for red flowers in combination with the allele for short pollen grains. Here we have the crossing over event, which of course occurs in prophase 1 of meiosis 1. Now notice that these genes for flower color and for pollen shape are located really close together on this chromosome. Because they are located really close together, it's very unlikely that crossing over will occur between them. So because these guys are already close together, they tend to stay close together, and crossing over has actually happened over here. Crossing over isn't separating these alleles from one another. Here we have the chromosomes after crossing over is complete. Notice that the big P's and big L's tended to stay together. They didn't get separated or mixed up with the little P's or little L's. And the little P's and little L's tended to stay together as well, even though other genes on this chromosome did get mixed up into new combinations. Here we have the four separate chromosomes that result from the end of meiosis II. These four chromosomes will go into four separate sex cells. Notice that 50% of these chromosomes contain big P and big L in combination, and the other 50% contain little p and little l in combination. Because 50% contain big P, big L, and 50% contain little p, little l, when two heterozygous plants carrying these gametes are bred together, the offspring are mainly going to be purple with long pollen grains and red with short pollen grains. Another type of linkage that can affect genetic outcomes is known as sex linkage. Sex linkage occurs because the X and the Y chromosome are not homologous. Look at these two chromosomes. They are not the same size, they are not the same shape, and they do not carry the same genes. The X chromosome carries over a thousand genes that are needed for just normal body functioning. So everyone has an X chromosome. You can't live without it. The Y chromosome, on the other hand, only carries about 78 genes, and all of these genes are related to making the body male. These chromosomes are inherited in different patterns in females than in males, so the genes that are carried on those chromosomes are also inherited in different patterns in females than in males. 
Females have two X's. They inherit an X from both parents, while males have an X chromosome from mom and a Y chromosome that came from dad. Genes carried on the X or the Y chromosome are said to be sex-linked. Specifically, genes that are carried on the X chromosome are sometimes called X-linked, and genes carried on the Y chromosome are sometimes called Y-linked genes. Females inherit two copies of the X chromosome, so they can be homozygous for traits on the X chromosome, or they can be heterozygous for those traits. That means that females can be carriers for certain traits on the X chromosome without expressing those traits. Males, on the other hand, only have one copy of the X chromosome. So that means that whatever allele they inherit on that X chromosome is the one that will be expressed. There isn't a second X chromosome present to cover up the actions of the other allele. So males cannot be carriers for sex-linked traits. Because males can't be carriers for sex-linked traits, sex-linked disorders carried on the X or Y chromosomes tend to show up more frequently in males than in females. Let's look at some examples. Color vision is produced by three types of color receptors found on the back of the eye in an area called the retina. There are receptors for red, green, and blue. The genes for making these receptors are carried on the X chromosome. In red-green color blindness, an individual inherits an allele that results in either a defective red or green receptor. People with this type of color blindness have difficulty distinguishing between red and green colors. Because the gene for color blindness is sex linked, females must inherit the defective allele from both parents in order to be colorblind. Females can also carry one allele for color blindness, but still have normal vision because the other X chromosome is carrying that normal vision gene. Males, on the other hand, only have to inherit the allele from one parent in order to be colorblind. That makes this condition much more common in males than in females. Because the gene is carried on the X chromosome, males inherit that gene from their mothers. This is a very common test for colorblindness known as an Ishihara test. This image is made of a bunch of little circles, each containing a different shade of green or red. If you have normal color vision, a number should pop out at you, and I believe the number for this one is 96. If you do not have normal color vision, that number may be a little bit hard to make out, or you may see a different number altogether. This image demonstrates what it might be like to have red-green color blindness. On the left, we have a bush with red flowers on it. That's what people with normal vision see. For someone with red-green color blindness, that image might look like this. You can see that the entire background kind of looks green and the flowers don't pop out at you. It's difficult for people with this type of color blindness to distinguish between red and green hues. Another sex-linked disorder is hemophilia. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder. People with this disorder don't make all of the proper clotting factors that they need in their blood and have difficulty forming blood clots when they cut themselves. People with hemophilia can also experience constant slow internal bleeding, which is a much larger problem. This disorder results in general weakness and malaise and can be fatal if the person really hurts themselves and can't stop bleeding. Now this disorder was very famously carried in the Russian and European royal families back in the early 20th century. And there is a picture of them. Aren't they a happy looking bunch? Here's the pedigree chart or family tree for the British royal family from about that time. On this chart, circles represent females and squares represent males. 
This blue color indicates that an individual has inherited the gene for hemophilia. If it's completely filled in, it means the individual has hemophilia. If it's only half filled in, it means that the individual is a carrier for the gene, but doesn't actually have hemophilia. Now let's look at the chart. You can see a couple of interesting things. First, you'll notice that there are a lot of blue squares on here, but there are no totally blue circles. This is because males are far more likely to have hemophilia than females because they only have to inherit that gene from one parent. They only inherit it from their mother. Females, on the other hand, can be carriers. So you do see a lot of female carriers, but you don't see any female hemophiliacs in this tree because none of the males um, happen to pass that on to their daughters. Another interesting thing you'll notice is that we can track this mutation back to its original source, and that just so happens to be Queen Victoria. She is the first person who carried this mutation into the family, and you can see that it persisted for several generations. So all of this sex linkage stuff begs the question, how do females cope with having two copies of the X chromosome when really only one is necessary? Well, the answer is something called X chromosome inactivation. It turns out that when a female is still a very young embryo, just a little ball of cells really, one of the X chromosomes in some of the cells will curl up into a little wad called a bar body, and that deactivates it. With that X chromosome deactivated, it allows the other X chromosome to be in charge. In other parts of the embryo, the other X chromosome will curl up into a bar body and allow the other X chromosome to be in charge of that area of the embryo. This all means that a female's body is really a mosaic of the two X chromosomes, with one of them being in charge of some parts of the body and the other being in charge of other parts of the body. We see a really great visual example of this in certain breeds of cats. In cats, there are two alleles for fur color, and they're both carried on the X chromosome. There's an allele for black fur and an allele for orange fur. Because female cats have two copies of the X chromosome, they have to inherit the black allele from both parents in order to be black in color. The same thing goes for orange. They have to inherit two orange alleles from each parent, one from each parent, in order to be orange in color. Females that are heterozygous for orange and black are calico, also known as tortoise shell. Now these black and orange patches are kind of interesting. The orange patches indicate areas of the skin in which the X chromosome carrying the orange gene is in charge. The black chromosome has been silenced in those areas. The black patches indicate areas of the skin where the X chromosome carrying the black gene is in charge and the orange gene has been silenced. So again, this is a great visual example because you can actually see the parts of the body in which one X chromosome is in charge over the other. Now because male cats only have one copy of the X chromosome, they're only going to inherit one of the fur color alleles. So male cats are typically either orange or black, but you don't see male calico cats. There are some rare examples of male calico cats, um, and this occurs when they have two X chromosomes and a Y, something that in humans is called Kleinsfelter syndrome. Next, we'll discuss how changes in the number of chromosomes that a person inherits can affect gene expression. When mistakes are made in separating the homologous chromosomes and sister chromatids during meiosis 1 and 2, respectively, something called non-disjunction occurs. Here we have a normal example of meiosis next to two different examples of non-disjunction. 
In meiosis I, homologous chromosomes separate from one another so that the resulting daughter cells only carry a single copy of each. In meiosis II, the sister chromatids within each duplicated chromosome separate, resulting in four daughter cells that are haploid. When non-disjunction occurs in meiosis I, the spindle fibers pull one or more of the homologous chromosomes in the wrong direction, causing them to travel to the wrong daughter cell. In this diagram, this little chromosome was supposed to travel over to this cell, but instead it went the wrong direction, so now it's in this cell. This results in two daughter cells that have an extra copy of that chromosome, and two daughter cells that lack that chromosome altogether. When non-disjunction occurs in meiosis II, the spindle fibers pull one or more of the sister chromatids in the wrong direction, causing it to move into the wrong daughter cell. For instance, on this diagram, this little sister chromatid was supposed to go this way and end up in this cell, but instead it went the wrong direction and it ended up in this cell over here. This type of non-disjunction results in two normal haploid cells, one cell that has an extra copy of the chromosome, and one cell that lacks that chromosome altogether. The cells formed by meiosis are haploid gametes, in other words, egg and sperm cells. If an egg carrying an extra copy of a chromosome is fertilized by a normal sperm cell, then the resulting zygote will have three copies of that chromosome. This is known as a trisomy. On the karyotype, you can see that this individual inherited an extra copy of chromosome 18. This condition is known as trisomy 18, or Edwards syndrome, and can be life-threatening, especially when the individual is very young. Now, on the other hand, if an egg cell that is lacking a chromosome is fertilized by a normal sperm cell, then the resulting zygote will only have one copy of that chromosome instead of the normal two. We refer to this condition as a monosomy. On this karyotype, you can see that this individual is lacking a copy of chromosome number nine. This is known as monosomy nine. Now, interestingly, animal systems and animal cells can usually deal with trisomies a little more effectively than monosomies. So most true monosomies end up being fatal. Trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome, is the most famous example of a trisomy. Individuals with trisomy 21 have an extra copy of chromosome number 21. Now because they have an extra copy of this chromosome, and because the chromosome carries hundreds of different genes for hundreds of different characteristics, Down syndrome can result in a wide range of phenotypic effects. Individuals with Down syndrome often have broad faces and sort of almond-shaped eyes, and sometimes they have developmental difficulties as well, but this can vary widely from individual to individual. On the left, we have a karyotype from someone with Down syndrome, and if you look closely, you'll see that they do indeed have three copies of that 21st chromosome. The graph on the right shows the likelihood of having a non-disjunction event occur with age, and what you can see is that the rate of non-disjunction drastically increases over the age of 40. Now you usually hear about this happening more with women over the age of 40, but it turns out that non-disjunction is actually just as likely in men over 40 as in women over 40. So why do women get the blame for this? Well, think of it this way. Because women only produce one egg cell per monthly cycle, if there's a non-disjunction event there, it's going to show up in that egg. But men produce 150 million sperm cells per ejaculation on average. So it's much more likely for that egg to be the source of a trisomy or monosomy than that sperm cell, since it's in such a big crowd.
Many conditions and syndromes occur because of an abnormal number of sex chromosomes. For instance, individuals with monosomy X, or XO, are lacking an X chromosome. On the other extreme, we have trisomy X. That's where the individual has an extra X chromosome. Now, because the female system is already used to just using one X chromosome at a time and wadding the other one up into a bar body, it seems that the female system can kind of deal with these, the lack of an extra chromosomes. In the case of monosomy X, the individual just uses that X chromosome all over the body instead of alternating between one and the other X chromosome. In the case of trisomy X, the individual will often have two of these X chromosomes wadded into bar bodies and will use one X chromosome in certain areas of the body, and then it will alternate between the other two in other areas of the body. So I told you that the female body is a mosaic of these genes on the X chromosomes. In the case of trisomy X, it's just a more complicated mosaic. Males can also have an abnormal number of sex chromosomes. For instance, some individuals have an extra Y chromosome, XYY. This is known as Jacobson syndrome, or super male condition. Individuals with this syndrome can have heightened aggression and decreased fertility, among other symptoms. It's also possible to have an extra X chromosome. This condition, XXY, is known as Kleinsfelter syndrome. Now, because that individual does have a Y chromosome, it does make the body male, but the presence of that extra X chromosome can actually have a feminizing effect on the body, especially during puberty. So individuals with Kleinsfelters can have partial breast development, for instance, during puberty. There are also changes that can occur in the structure of chromosomes that can cause lots of different kinds of problems. Deletion mutations, for instance, can cut chunks out of chromosomes and make them shorter. Insertions and translocations can add chunks to chromosome structures and make them longer. Whenever you have chromosomes that are of differing lengths, they're going to have trouble going through processes such as crossing over. So these chromosomes are going to have difficulty with division, and of course that's going to affect the gene expression of the genes on those chromosomes. All right, you guys, you're finished. You made it all the way to the end of the chapter. I hope you found all of this genetic stuff interesting. I certainly did. Be sure to complete your notes and be thorough and bring them to class and we'll talk about them there.